few who've come. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is our content management service, which we have. Um, we set up just over two years ago now, and it's a review, really, of how we set it up and how it's running now. I'm from the uh, computing service at the University of Cambridge. Um, we look after all the departments within the University of Cambridge, which is several hundred. Um, the colleges are a separate thing, which we look after themselves. Okay, so a bit of background. We spent 10 years thinking about getting an open source CMS. Um, we've had a homegrown system in house for all of that time, so we've never felt the need to get something more creative. Um, I say that we took a shortcut route. Actually, we just couldn't be bothered to go through a whole process of evaluation because it, by the time you've evaluated everything, you're back to the beginning because everything's changed. Uh, so what we did was we kept, kept a mental shortlist over time, so we decided what would be appropriate and kept an eye on that. We looked at how other people had investigated CMSs in our position, so looking at open source CMS in the university environment. Um, we kept realistic about what we could do, so what um, skills that we had in-house, because we didn't have the capacity to start learning new skills, so we had to be able to skill it already. And also, we went and talked to people to shortlist systems. So we went to other people in a, uh, in a comparative situation and found out what exactly they were doing, how they were coping with it. The requirements that we had at this stage were that we had to have a straightforward user interface because what this was going to do was going to be a CMS which we gave to people to use rather than hosting it and having users coming in and putting their content giving them a hosted CMS service which they would then administrate themselves. So there was the overhead of them having to be able to have a simple interface into it and also their users to have a simple interface into it. It, has to, it also had to support what we had in our departmental templates which we just got in 2008. Um, we use range of less authentication within the university so it had to be amenable to that and also to our lookup service, which is an LDAP service, um, which maintains all our list of users. It also had to be amenable to being rolled out as a managed service. At that time, we also thought we would give it out as a, a bigger package for local use, and it turned out we didn't do that in the end. So having taken everything into consideration, we decided we'd give the phone a shot, because it seemed to be the thing that would do it best for us. The reason why we went through this exercise at this time, is that a lot of university websites, because the impetus had gone into setting things up for cross-institutional use, so a lot of universities within the UK and universities within Europe were having joint uh, projects, and there was a continued need for a website for a joint project. And of course, because it didn't belong to the department, then it, it, the department didn't really want to host it. So there was a continual need some disposable websites, some websites that didn't really have an owner. And what was happening was that they were getting money to set up these websites, they were using them for a short time, and administratively, they no longer, no longer knew how to support it. The next administrator would come along and say, oh, don't understand this, I think I'll just throw it away and make a new one. So it was costing the university quite a lot of money, continually recreating new websites. So, our project was to create a hosted supported model site so that, that we could give them a model site that would do everything that they needed, was university templated, they could use it, and the training would be there for a, an administrator to succeed them when that administrator left. So it would never get into the position where it needed to be thrown away because it could always be taken on by somebody else. Um, so we, they were creating a hosted supported model site. That could be administrated by a person or a group of people because of the way the user and group um, management is in phone. It was easy to administrate it by a person or a group of people. And they could add web managers to their site. So once they became confident, they could do all of that themselves. Uh, we were within the university template so that they couldn't stray off the piece too easily. Um, and the, uh, the responsibility for the 
site could easily be passed on. We got a small amount of money, we got £30,000 um, to bring this about, and um, we selected a few candidate projects to actually start with, to start the systems with. So this was our needs list that we started with. Um, what they needed was to have a director of specialists, so some kind of, um, let's call it a faculty staff directory, um, was needed for the site. Um, we needed to be able to pull out research themes because for the first tranche of sites that we were doing, they were mostly research-based sites. Let's face it, University of Cambridge is really a research-based university, so almost all of our sites are research-based. They wanted to have news in the newsletter, they wanted to publish events, they wanted to have a notice board, they wanted to also to publish static information, uh, they needed to have collaborative areas, um, they wanted to push out job opportunities, so yet another kind of events listing which listed jobs, and they also wanted to be able to have self sign up for events. So that was what we had in our needs list when we started. For site administrators, we came up with a range of things for them. We realised that if we gave them something that was so tightly locked down, um, they couldn't change anything, then they would hate it, because that's what they do. So we gave them a colour palette for a list of options for changing the colour background on the site. So there's a, a, there's a set of accepted palette colours that they can use. They can add local, use, local logos. So if they've got a logo for their site, almost all of these research groups have some kind of living logo. So uh, they could also uh, add their name to the site and configure the search box. Um, they current, in the existing site, they have an option whether they can have tab navigation or not. They can turn this on and off. They can select optional content for the right panel of the site. So all kinds of portlets can go into the right panel of the site. They can footer so that the footer can be configured site-wide or on a folder-by-folder -folder basis because some of the departmental sites have got their own ship spread across several groups of people. They can manage groups and they can configure the research directory if they're going to use it. At the information provider level, they needed to be able to add and edit content, obviously, and manage the corresponding matter and navigation in that content. Um, we have a query over whether some of the information providers manage other editors. So in some cases, the permissions are cascaded down, so they get permission for a whole uh, a folder and the levels down from that, and they can manage their editors in that. Um, they, will ha they have to ask for right-hand panel modules to be added because they don't have access to do that themselves, and they can also request a footer if they want to. So they don't get anywhere near the amount of access to changing things as the administrator. In terms of functionality, we realised that there were a huge amount of plugins available and we had to be fairly focused on what we were going to give them in order for them to be able to use. So we had the research directory as, as the main impetus for the site, handling RSS feeds. Um, creating redirections, creating message boards, and creating forms. So those were the functionality things that we knew that we had to have. So having got our rather detailed list of what we expected and what we wanted, um, we did a bit more groundwork, so a bit more on what features should be in the site, uh, how the site should look and work, how this should be used to create a rollout package that could then be used to generate sites, and all of this was written up into a spec which we used to select a contractor. Now, we realised that um, because we had no knowledge of Plone, uh, apart from on a very cursory level, the only way to achieve this was actually to get a contractor in. So what we spent our 30000 on was getting a contractor in for eight weeks. And this was on the basis of doing the work and transferring knowledge to us. So um, we had them on site and uh, we worked very closely with them so that we could actually get to know the system, get the system built in the eight weeks that they were there. Um, in order to do this effectively, we had to have a really detailed brief. And I don't know quite what the skill set is of the people in the audience, but I'm sure some of you are contractors and some of you aren't. But having a contractor, having a, 
a very detailed brief I think is very useful on both sides because the contractor has a better idea of what exactly it is that they're doing and the um, person who's uh, setting up the site gets a chance to really get their ideas in order as to what it is they're trying to achieve. Um, during the work on site, we've realised that we had to really clear our diaries. So the people who were local staff who were being um, taught had to clear their diaries completely for the whole time because, uh, and practically live with the contractor because otherwise this wasn't going to work effectively. Um, Contingencies were really difficult. Nobody could take leave and nobody could be off sick because otherwise we would lose part of our eight weeks and you're not going to get that back. So we struggled in through thick and thin. That was the winter in Britain where we had tremendous cold and snowfalls. And we had trudging through the snow wearing Wellington boots to get into work to do this. But it, we did it. And... Um, it was essential to have good project management to make sure that you got the issues covered in the eight-week period that you had. Otherwise, it just wasn't going to get finished, and that would be a disaster. Because in universities, if you get £30,000 to do it, that's it. End of story. No more money. So you, that's what you have to achieve at end. Okay, so... The eight weeks comes and goes, the contract finished, we tidied up the obvious loose ends, so there were obviously there were things that we'd missed once you start transferring information into your model site, you suddenly find that actually, oh yeah, we didn't say that, mm, yes, that doesn't look very good. So we had to do that for tweaking, this took about four or five months while we were um, sorting out the bits and pieces. So we finally published our first site um, May or June 2010, so it's just over two years ago now. Um, by that time, we also had a few more internal sites underway using the same model. <coughs> we called our service Falcon. We have a tradition of bird names for services within the computing service. Don't know why, but it's Falcon. So, who are we, the people who actually manage Falcon? There are two of us. Um, there's me. I handle all the initial user contact, the support, the training, also the styling and the user interface issues. And there's my technical colleague, David, who isn't here, um, but he is at the conference. He handles all of the technical side of it, the installation, management of hardware, uh, troubleshooting, all that sort of stuff. However, we both also do other things. This isn't just our total job. David actually manages the email system in the university, so it's a bit of an extra job there. And I am the university webmaster and manage websites throughout the university, so I have a bit of an extra job too. So there's just two parts of us that manage this service, so it's essential that really it goes smoothly, otherwise we're in deep shit. So, in June 2010, we actually opened the service to users. Um, Having started off with the idea that we would do um, a research-based site, particularly for research initiatives uh, and across institutions, in the end, actually, what we'd created was a site model that was suitable for almost anybody within the university except for colleges. So anybody who was going to use the university template could use the model that we'd created. Um, so... What we, had to, what we realised we would have to, do, have to do when we opened the service is that we would have to choke demand by some means because otherwise we'd be absolutely overcome by the people wanting sites. So to do that, we put a charge on the site. It's a nominal charge, it's £100 a year, which really isn't very much at all, but it's enough to choke off some of the people who otherwise would be coming saying, I'd like five sites, please, because I'd like to make all of my research groups, and we couldn't have coped if that had happened. So what we use our £100, we, we actually did quite carefully work out £100 on the basis that that would buy us new hardware. So the number of sites that we could put on an instance, we could have um, three years and then we would have the money for new hardware for that particular group of sites. Um, what we do is we charge from the time that the site goes live. 
So when we associate a domain name with the site, the site is said to go live, and that's when we charge them. What this means is that they can come in, they can try the system out. If they don't get on with it, then they can just abandon it and we don't charge them. So that's some, a way to actually get them to use the service because they, you know, they don't have to pay up front. Okay, so what do we offer? Um, when, when people want to have a site, we set up a site overnight uh, similar to, on a URL similar to this. Uh, so it's going to be HTTP www.falcon and then it's slight slash, oh, sorry, slash site slash and then it's the site name. Um, this is just a short name and this is the holding site before it actually goes live. So initially what we have to get from them is some managers for the site, the short name for the site, a role-based email address and ultimately we'll need a domain name for the site. So while they're working on it, they're working on the site at, at this URL. This is protected from being indexed. It's not protected um, from access, but nobody really knows that's there. So it's not pointed to from very many places. Um, sometimes people get a bit paranoid about security and, oh, is this private? Nobody's going to be able to see it. Well, yeah, if they find it, they'll be able to see it, but how are they going to find it? Um, so that's how, where the sites are initially set up. Um, we set these up via a form um, and uh, then the, all of the setting up is automatic. And what they get is a pre-styled vanilla site with all the functionality in it, which I'll show you in a minute. We collect sites into an internal list and this all looks like this. So this is the... Uh, the the site with all the internal lists on it. As you can see, there's quite a few of them by now. Um, so what we have is, uh, this is the short name for the site, and then once they get a domain name associated with them, this is the public interface to the site, so they're all listed in the one place. Now, what a vanilla site looks like, whoops, right. uh, Okay, so that's what the vanilla site looks like that they get. So they get the site, they got it, all of it set up and already templated for them. So when we've set up the site, it looks similar to that. Okay, so there it is. Um, they get the view on the left, and of course when they log in, they get the view on the right. So they're using their university ID for authenticating to it, which they use for everything else. So this is Ravenshibleth authentication. So it means that they always know it. They don't have to have a password that they, they um, have to remember. And one of the big selling points for it is that they can then access it from anywhere. So they can work from home, they can work when they're away from the university, they don't actually have to be in the domain in order to access their site. So we support our users in a number of ways. So our site managers are really our primary users because they're the ones that uh, do all the initial work. We've got an email support list which comes to both of us so that we see anything that comes in that way. I do one, to one sessions with site managers. Usually I do about an hour session when they're initially talking about setting up their site so that they can get the idea of what it is they can do and how to structure their site. Some of them have never set up websites before. Some of them have got lots of experience. I don't know which is worse actually. Um, we have um, a user group session a couple of times a year. This has happened since we've had a lot of sites because we've got enough people now that a user group is going to um, have 40 or 50 people in it. And we also have a help site, which is one of the main planks of user support. So the help site I built up while we were doing the when I was initially setting up the site. So this is the help site, um, and they can go through and find the answers to most of their queries while they're trying to do it. 
only if only they would most of them seem to be totally unable to read so uh, they don't look at that at all um, by the time we got a critical mass so after about 11 months so by May 2011 I started doing training courses before that we didn't have enough sites that training courses were going to work because there wouldn't be enough people each time looking at it uh, in the cold light of day, a training course has to achieve something for me. I spend two half days doing a training course. I can only train between 10 and 15 people at a time. So it has to pay for itself in terms of my time. So if there's, more, if there's less than about six of them, then it would be quicker for me just to sit down for an hour with each of them and go through everything in detail. So you do, you do have to be a bit sort of hard-headed about these things when things are worth doing. Um, so the course that I do runs for two half days, preferably adjacent days, but it doesn't always work out like that. I now run a course every month, so every month I do two half day courses. In the last year I've trained over 100 people doing that. Um, so I have to keep up with demand and I have to have the training courses planned out in advance because quite often people want to speculate when they can send their staff unless you've got your timetable laid out for that then they're not going to it's all building trust for the service and unless they can have a trust that it's always going the training is always going to be there for them then they don't sort of throw themselves into it properly so two half days first day gives an introduction to the service the second day gives more about their technical administration um, quite often people will only come to the first day if they're going to just be a user of the site rather than an admin because um, they don't need to know all the other stuff I'm also setting up another range of courses for managers now more concentrated on specific topics that they have troubles with things like managing users and groups and writing content rules which is completely opaque to most people how to do it. Right, assigning a domain name. When the sites are ready to go live, a domain name is assigned to it. So um, this can take up to 24 hours because we have to get a security certificate. We, have, we can issue ourselves security certificates. We have an internal security certificate thing, but it can take 24 hours to do that. If they've got an existing site that they need to swap over, we also have the overhead that the DNS has to be able to change. Um, so we've got a kind of pattern of it. We usually do that over a weekend. But the point is that we have to try and get them to not say, oh, could you make myself my site live this afternoon, which often they fall into that trap. and It takes us longer than that. Um, although we have ongoing issues with Shibboleth, we do sometimes register sites with the UK Federation so that they can be cross-institutional sites. In practice, this doesn't really work very well because of the type of information that the UK Federation um, sends and the kind of information that Plone can accept in terms of a shibboleth logon. There are problems there that we haven't yet solved and I don't honestly know whether they're soluble, um, but we're working on it at the moment because it is a very um, important aspect of it for us. We also do use a company called Protect Network where you can have third party shibboleth IDs assigned. So if the person doesn't come from an institution that has their own shibboleth ID, then they can get a shibboleth ID from ProtectNet. Okay, so the sites that we host uh, fall into five broad categories. Um, we've got departments. We've probably got about um, eight departments, eight to ten departments on there now. We've got lots of research groups. So this is within some of the big and not so big uh, departments. Each research group wants to have their own website. We have cross-departmental and cross-institutional groups, increasingly with research wanting to go cross-departmental, these are in demand. Conference and special interest sites, it's attractive for that because they're disposable, so people can uh, set up their site, have it for the year that they want for that particular conference, and then we can just turn it off and it's not a problem. And also there are research initiatives and networks, which was the primary target for the service. Uh, the departmental sites see most traffic. Some of the other sites really receive a negligible amount of traffic. Um, so for the, from the sites that we've got at the moment, some of them 
about four of them are making up almost all of the traffic for the whole of the service. Um, and But all the rest of them, of course, still need to be there. So this is just a little overview of the sites that are hosted. Um, I can show you some of the live sites in a minute if it would be more useful. Um, it kind of gives you a flavour of what's available. So when I said that you could change the um, colour palette, you can see that the colour of the strip at the top and the navigation bar changes. So they all look slightly different from each other. You can give them enough versatility that they don't feel completely trapped by the house style. Um, our um, external services office loathe and abhor the idea that they can put their own logos on there. They think that they, used to, they ought to just have the university logo and not have the logos of their own um, uh, site, but people love to have a logo. They like to have be individual, so it's really hard to take it away from them. Okay, so what's happened since June 2010? Um, there's been a gradual increase in the number of sites we have. Sometimes it doesn't feel gradual at all. Sometimes it feels like they're beating a path to my door. Um, the periodic dip is when we clear test sites that are no longer needed. So about every four to six months, I go through the list of sites that are in development and contact the ones that don't look like they're developing them anymore and say, look, can we dump your sites because they're getting to be a bit of an overhead? Because every site that we've got... Yes, every site that we've got that um, is taking up CPU time just to run it. So if we didn't have them, it would be better for us. So that big dip is when I had a clear out. Um, <clears throat> so by now, as of last Friday, we had 65 live sites and 45 in test or development. So that's over 100 sites that we're running at the moment on this. Uh, additionally to that, we've got another set of sites which we use for training and for development for ourselves. So, we hit a slight problem area when we were developing this. Um, Plone 4 was due out in December 2009, but what a surprise, it didn't appear until September 2010. So, we had to develop our initial sites in Plone 3, but what we did was built it as far as possible so we could move it straight into Plone 4. So we took into consideration all the things that we would need to do to make it work into Plone, in Plone 4. Um, however, because we're, develop we're dependent on quite a few plugins, we couldn't move to Plone 4 until mid-2011. So not until all of the plugins that we used were absolutely solid on, um, on Plone 4. Um, since then, we've done two major changes and upgrades and two minor ones. Um, so currently, we're in a position of the university templates being re redesigned again, and we're positioned for uh, the Plone 4.2 upgrade. So all of that has been a, quite a, a lot of work to keep ourselves up to date, but we feel that we really have to do it. And we're anticipating moving into 4.3 in the middle of next year providing that everything keeps going as it should. All of these sites are independent of each other, so um, upgrades can be made to a site one at a time. You, can only, you don't have to do them all, all at the same time. Um, what we do is to routinely do our upgrades on a, a group of sites. We do five or six at a time. Uh, so we back them up beforehand, and then we make sure that they're checked afterwards by the people, either by the people that run the site or by us to make sure that everything transferred fine. Um, because different sites use different features, it can be quite tricky to pinpoint where we have problems. So when we do our upgrades, it can be quite hard for some sites to work out where the problems are coming from. These are the plugins we use at the moment. Um, so all of the sites have got these. So we've got Carousel, uh, faculty staff directory and the extensions, uh, feed mixer, keyword manager, quick upload portlet, plone form gen, plone board for internet, reduction tool, web server auth and SEO optimizer. So all of the sites have all of those. Um, they don't all use them, but they are all there. We started off the service with one pair of servers. So we have the second server for redundancy, which we host off-site. 
um, we have to have a business plan for if we get bombed. So we have a server off-site that we can transfer to. We now have two pairs of larger servers, um, which we run for the site, and we also have uh, two pairs of servers spare so that we can add them in when we need them. Um, we do a cron job and a backup every night and do load monitoring every night as well to make sure all the sites are okay. And we use a varnish cache. If you want to know more about the technical stuff, you can ask David. He'll be around um, at coffee time, uh, but he'd be happy to tell you all of the techie stuff that he does, which I don't have to think about. Right, so getting on to what, what we think about what we've achieved. Certainly the good part of it was that there was a pent-up demand for something like this. Um, the demand still remains, so there's quite a, a continuous need within the university for sites that people don't have to manage the hardware and they don't have to manage the system themselves. because. Most of them just can't do it um, or can't do it safely. And increasingly, they're understanding that the last thing, that they can't do it safely. We are a continual target for people trying to hack our sites. And uh, just because we're us, you know, they just want to take a pop out. Us. So um, we've had a whole round of hackings this summer, which are convincing people that really running some old WordPress site really isn't worth it while and they should move to something that's managed so that they don't have to worry about it. Um, the directory is very popular. Faculty staff directory is a very popular thing to have there. It's an easy way for them to put in research information and have it shown in a number of faceted ways. So it's, it's very presses all the buttons as far as institutional desire for research is concerned. Um, the new templates which we've got, which I'll show you right at the end, are responsive templates which we've just commissioned, we've just got them. They're almost impossible to manage them by hand, um, so we're anticipating quite a lot of pe more people will be moving into the service when they discover that. Um, we're telling them that, but I know they'll have to see for themselves before they really believe us. Um, so the system makes it easier for people to produce web pages and it improves the quality. So overall the quality of web pages in the university is has increased. Um, we found that it was straight, relatively straightforward to create once we'd got the consultancy help, once we'd learned exactly what we were doing. It's um, the supported for plugins do many of what we want and it's very reliable when we leave it to its own devices so it just happily goes on and doesn't cause us any problems. The bad things about it, first is if you have a site manager who wants to fiddle with things. Um, it's not very obvious how to them how they can break things. They can break things in any number of weird and wonderful ways and usually they don't know what they've done so they can't tell you what they did to create this awful heap that they've left you with. Um, the site, there's a, a tranche of site managers uh, who don't think they need to do any training because they've used a content management system before so obviously they don't need to have training and then they complain that they can't use it. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. Um, we have issues with very obscure problems related to plugins, so interrelated problems with plugins, which are often caused by doing upgrades. They can take a long time to track down, and um, I, we have to say that from our point of view, and I think from many other people's point of view, Plone is more complicated behind the scenes than it needs to be. I think this is an acknowledged thing. It's not new for me to say that. It's the years of accumulated stuff which make for a complicated background, and it makes for this kind of position for when you get into related problems. To upgrade to a new version of Plone is hard work, and both times we've had obscure bugs brought to light because of it. Um, and to update over 100 sites is time consuming, even if you can do it a batch at a time. Um, we did have a rather a difficult time last year when 
David got knocked off his bike and broke himself and was off for eight weeks. And if, there's a, if it's a two-person team that's doing the sites, having one person laid off and at home is terrible um, because there's nobody to step into their shoes and it's a real struggle to keep running a service which then is become dependent. So it's a, a big risk. The ugly part of it is wishing that we'd really done something rather basic differently and knowing that you can't change it because it's too intrinsic to what you've got to be able to change it once you've got it running. Um, other ugly things are the way some site admins find to style their sites. You don't know what they're on, but heaven knows They'll, they find something difficult to do. And the obscure problems, the, the fact that things can break in really odd ways for instance, we found if somebody creates an object with a short name that clashes with something else in the system, they don't get any warning, they don't get told, it just throws a wobbly. And it takes us quite a long time to try and sort those things out. They're things that shouldn't happen or we should be more aware of them going to happen. Um, okay, so a summary of where we are just now. Um, when we started, when I started all of this, I was told that you to really get on with a CMS, you had to be prepared to marry it. And I would probably agree with this. Um, sometimes it drives you mad, like any partner does. Uh, most of the time it does the job and we get on. Um, it can eat time and you have to plan it, really, to make it work. Generally, what we have to try and get over to people is there's more to creating and running a website than just being able to do it through the web. They understand it. They, site admins don't understand this, and they will blame the system. For almost all of these things, they will blame the system when things don't work out for them. So it's, it's very difficult to train them adequately so they stop doing that. I think probably for any CMS this would be the case. So it's not, going, it's not just plone. Um, Certainly the most successful sites we've got have been created by people who had some web skills already and were prepared to ask questions and were prepared to be trained. And then they've achieved something much better. Um, because everybody gets the same site model, we can only make improvements that are going to be acceptable to everybody. So you really have to keep focused and you have to be prepared to say, no, we can't do that. Um, although we encourage people to ask, we encourage people to, when they want to have a new feature, we say, just ask and we might be able to do it for you. And probably it's been about 50-50. Those ones have, some of them have been successful and we've done them, and some of them we've just had to say no because everybody else would hate it. So uh, I'm afraid we can't. Um, often we have problems with people not wanting to use the university templates. Some people will say, oh, I'm not going to use this, it's too restrictive. And then they get some hacking incident or they discover that running Drupal actually isn't very easy and they'll come back. So we've had several of them come back after they've gone away. So what have we learnt? We've learnt it's crucial to keep up with releases. Um, anticipate what the release is going to do for you and also anticipate that you might have to wait for your plugins in order to do those things. Uh, we have to police the plugins really carefully. So we, are, we have a very hard line on what we're going to accept and what we're not. If they don't look like they're going to do the job and keep being upgradable, then we just can't use them. We've had to remove at least one of them since we started because it went pear-shaped. Um, you have to anticipate like you do with a marriage what's going to cause trouble and deal with it before it gets out of hand. Uh, and that really only comes with experience. So two years of experience have taught us a lot. We've also learned that buying in developer time can be extremely productive. It's certainly worthwhile for us. It teaches us an enormous amount. Having a developer on site has taught us a tremendous amount that we wouldn't have otherwise found out. So the future, we've just received new responsive templates for the university. Um, this is what they look like. Oh, no, not that, not that. Oh, have I lost them? 
this minute. Okay, so this is our first um, go at putting our new responsive templates into uh, Falcon, and you can see they're fully responsive, so when you change it, they change completely and go down. Uh, this gives us a challenge. It's actually been um, not, not to um, underestimate the work that it was, but it was surprisingly straightforward once we'd cracked some of the more difficult problems. Um, so we had a consultant in for 10 days to help us do that, and it's smoothed out the path of it a lot. Um, we've had to re-engineer the site model to both take advantage of how Plone works now, which is di different to when we initially set it up, and also accommodate the new templates and the new functionality that they bring. We've now got different functionality in different places. We now have to work out how to convert our pilots, our, our sites through, uh, so upgrading the templates in the sites rather than upgrading the sites themselves, which is a different challenge that we've had up until now. Um, okay, that's me finished. Is there any questions? Yes, Matt. I'm not sure that it's Plone that's the problem when it comes to training users. I think it's that getting them into the mentality of a CMS that's actually the problem. So is there something that could be done to help explain or educate the way Plone works in that regard? Not that I can spot. Okay. Not that I can spot initially. There are plenty of things that are more difficult than they need to be in terms of system administration. Um, one of the things, I mean, Content rules are incredibly useful for system administrators and they're really, really difficult for them to learn to use. It's really hard to explain how to use them. Um, and, uh, collections also are difficult, but I know that work's been done on that already. But I would say content rules are a nightmare. Um, yes, another question. Yes. We've got um, we've got our two servers and their separate instances on the two servers. So there's a ZO server and then there's instances that sit on there. Does that answer your question? Ask David if you don't understand what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No. Well, you can always come and ask me. I'm I'm around for the rest of the time. Thank you. Thank you.